Welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure to be joined today by Esme Partridge. Esme and I keep running into each other at various events around London and maybe other places. And uh, one of those would be uh, the Plato dinners organized by our common friend Ryan Hacker. And Esme is a writer, but also currently postgraduate student of the philosophy of theology at Cambridge. And you've written a piece on AI and how Plato can respond to the threat of AI, which we'll be discussing today, sort of a, a, a response to the threat to learning that AI poses in terms of the Platonic Socratic method of the teacher-student interaction. But Esme is also interestingly going into the significance here and the role of memory, which is very important. Now, before we begin, I'd just, uh, because I think in the piece you also mention H.G. Wells, not to be confused with yeah. the other Wells, uh, and Julian Huxley, and, uh, and of course his brother Elders Huxley is mentioned implicitly as well. And around the same time, this must be, this is something that I'm, that I'm increasingly aware of, that the ninth, that time in Britain must have been there must have been something in the air when it comes to the so-called uh, sort of future. Um, and I say so-called because, you know, but the future to these uh, men seems to have been something that is in total uh, human control. You mentioned Wells' uh, world brain. Uh, someone else who was around at the time was John Maynard Keynes, who foresaw that in the 21st century, we will be living off the substance, the economic substance uh, that's been... Um, built up by then. Bertrand Russell foresaw in his essay in praise of idleness that thanks to full automation, we would be liberated and could enjoy idleness again. So we have these promises of, of AI, let's say, or automation in general technology liberating us. Now, I think you see that quite differently and so do I, but let's, uh, let's hear it from you. Um, yeah, so um, I guess the central argument that I'm trying to make uh, in that article and also elsewhere as well is that AI as a technology basically exteriorizes basic human cognitive faculties to an inhuman prosthesis, if you like. Um, there's a really interesting critic of technology called Bernard Stiegler, um, and those are words that, that he uses, like this idea of, of exteriorization. I think it's um, very relevant to, to AI because it is this kind of external organ that conjures information and processes that information in turn basically thinks for us. Um, so I'm quite interested in, in in seeing AI in that way and then considering what the consequences are of that. Um, and I'm doing so through the lens of Plato. Um, so famously uh, in the Phaedrus, uh, Plato presents this critique of writing um, and it's based on this, this myth, which I, if you don't mind, I may as well retell. Please. Yeah. So, so the the idea is that the ancient Egyptian deity Thoth, who is said to be the inventor of mathematics, uh, geometry, astronomy, uh, he has an idea, uh, writing, and he goes to the king of Egypt and he presents this idea to the king and says, "I've discovered this new art. Uh, this is going to." be as a cause for wisdom it's going to it's going to improve people's memory it's going to make them more knowledgeable and wise um what do you think um i'm not literally in those terms and then the king says no this is this is a really bad idea because what you're doing is by putting knowledge into an inhuman entity if you're once you're once you're exteriorizing if you like that knowledge to to a written a static uh, format you are basically inhibiting the potential of that information to actually speak to people it becomes a dead letter uh, rather than a living transmission of knowledge and of course the whole format of the platonic dialogue is about that interpersonal dialectical transmission of knowledge and it's so fundamental to learning that you've got these two interlocutors one is one is more 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 learned than the other and is working with that other person and, and their knowledge and their way of thinking um and you know everyone's way of thinking is extremely unique and so a teacher needs to be 
accommodating of, of that of your of your particularities um and so that's that's why plato is 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 using that that dialectical method with writing you completely lose that you have the knowledge it is just a static assemblage of, of of dead letters it can't speak to the person and the reason why this is so dangerous well i mean two two main reasons why it's dangerous but they're very interrelated um one is that it is unable to work with people and their particular dispositions and um, what that means is that people are going to easily misunderstand it they'll see a piece of text but because they don't have that pedagogical authority to guide them to what it really means it can very easily be mis misconstrued um, and the words that are used in in the phaedrus to describe that are it will it will drift everywhere and get into the wrong hands i think i'm paraphrasing um but this idea of it, of it drifting it, it not having the right audience and being misunderstood uh, and the second problem which is said explicitly again is this notion that by having the knowledge exteriorized in it in that in that fixed um, albeit ossified state um, people will cease to exercise their memory so see when you when you have a conversation with someone like we're having now uh, everything you say everything i say will become a part of us or become a part of our own of our memory of our own experiences and we will come to our own conclusions from those things that we have we have exchanged that from those utterances um whereas if you move learning if you move the transmission of knowledge away from that interpersonal context and into this fixed um this fixed body of body of writing um you don't have to remember things anymore and i mean we'll talk a bit more about why memory is so important in the platonic epistemology i'm sure um but that's essentially the problem it's the the depersonalization of knowledge and thus the potential for it to be to be mis misinterpreted uh, and the fact that it inhibits human memory and both of these things are seen as inimical to wisdom so my argument is basically that ai is kind of an extreme version um of that that dead letter because it's it's exteriorizing knowledge to a completely inhuman entity that's probably a, a, a very uh <laughs> As, as as comprehensive as I could possibly be in that summary um, yeah. overview of the of the article, um, but if any points that you wanted us to go into more, I'd be really happy to. Thank you. So, ironically, obviously, uh, Thoth introduces this technique to Thamos to the king, um, as because he thinks that it's or he claims that it's actually a tool for memory. Mm. for uh, increasing the capacity of memory. And the king responds, and I think in Greek, Plato makes a distinction between uh, nimi, which is just memory, and hypo nimi, or hypo nimi. And mm. hypo, hypothesis, so it's a, it's a memory that is below or beneath actual memory. Sometimes the, 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 the translations always differ, but it could be something like, um, instead of genuine memory, something like uh, just a, a recollection or so. So not something that is ultimately really imprinted um, in us or becomes our own, but is still somewhat um, externalized, as you say. Now, I'd like to uh, understand, though, I mean, so just obviously it's a bit also ironic that Plato relates the story and his teacher, as you know, didn't write anything down, but uh, Plato decided to uh, write dialogues and... Um, and the other question would be, <clears throat> are we not, in a way, ourselves now in dialogue, for example, with Plato and his teacher Socrates to a certain degree, thanks to the very writings that um, have been handed down to us? So, uh, is not in, I mean, and I think you get, you, you've already touched on the difference uh, there um, between what ChatGPT, for example, will mean in terms of writing uh, the purely, the merely dead letter that cannot come to life. But maybe you can just tell us a bit more about the difference here. Yeah, yeah. Well, also, thank you for introducing that Greek terminology. Um, that's incredibly helpful. And I, and as you say, it does point to that subtle difference between a, a kind of sub-memory. Um, I think the English translation, forgive me if I'm wrong, is a reminder um, yes. rather than yeah. an actual internalized memory. And that, I think, actually helps me to answer your question, because writing can be incredibly useful uh, as a kind of reminder, um, as 
uh, a, a means of quickly accessing a certain fact or some other data point of information. Um, but the difference, I think, is how do you convert that basic reminder or that basic uh, data point into wisdom? And I think it's it's that's where the interpersonal idea is that the interpersonal aspect is is necessary. Um, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes and sense. And I would also say, I mean, I know with, with regards to the uh, with the irony of the um, of yeah. the dialogue format. I mean, I think speaking from experience, actually, you do you do actually absorb the contents of Platonic Plato dialogues better yeah. when you read them aloud. So I think the text does invite you to emulate that the interpersonal. Exactly. Um, Look, it, it makes sense, but it only makes sense to those who will accept and affirm that in order to even attain knowledge. Not even you know, not even speaking of wisdom uh one we have to make errors and we have mm. to be uh we have to be able to fail whereas those who would say who would argue in favor of hyper intelligent uh super machines that can respond to just about anything within a nanosecond are not really prone to error or if they are, then it's just because of a mistake of programming. And once that error has been eradicated, it cannot make the error again, which is also debatable. Um, but so what when we say a living dialogue, the living dialectic, we have to, I think, um, accept that we could be wrong. <laughs> and it very often is yeah. because we are uh, wrong or at least not correct. Um, or f on the path to finding out something um, that we are that we actually get to the truth, and then also there's you know facts are not what's that quote from Zappa? Information is not knowledge. Knowledge is not wisdom, etc. Um, um, and Nietzsche said something about the fact, which uh, he says something. I think the fact is a prostitute. Uh, so um, facts go uh, wherever basically uh, someone <laughs> pays more for them. Um, but mm, interesting an analogy, yeah. Yeah, go on. Oh no, I was just going to say um, I, I agree. It's it's the question of of how the information is used, and I mean it would be it would be silly to say that books, for example, can't inspire wisdom because obviously they can, but so essential i think i mean in, in most cases anyway to drawing out that wisdom is that interpersonal element so it's when i say that i mean the potential to firstly have a text introduced to you by somebody who knows more hence you often get expert authors and scholars writing introductions to translations that is in a way a kind of bringing the text to life you know albeit through through writing but it's a dialogue across time right it's still a kind of dialogue and and you know just the same you can read the text yourself but then after you've done that have a debate with somebody about it and then in the very process of doing that you are once again bringing it to life so i think it's very possible for that dead letter if you like to be resuscitated by a living teacher by by living people um, and so that's where I think the um, the the criticism of writing can be qualified a bit. I mean, it's, it would be you know it would it would be false to say that it's the writing in and of itself has been the end of of wisdom. Um, and that's also kind of where I a bit later in the article um, talk about the internet versus AI um, because I think that that there's also a that's where you start to see a, an important convergence as well in the degree of interpersonal um, mediation. Yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, um, so I, I sort of trace... take all the time you need. Yeah. Okay. So, in the in the article, um, I sort of trace the the the, the sort of move from writing as the first technology which exteriorizes knowledge, um, which obviously Plato's warning about. Um, but you know, within quite a few centuries, that becomes that becomes the norm. So you have you have writing, um, and then you have the internet. Um, and you mentioned H.G. Wells and the world brain, um, because he, that, that is really, really very significant, I think, to this, this idea of the exteriorization of knowledge. So you basically go from a kind of pre-modern pedagogical program, um, which is, you know, big in the Christian world, but also you have Jewish and Islamic traditions of learning, which are also very much based on, on kind of dialogue and pluralism of different interlocutors. Um, that Platonic ideal really is upheld 
seemingly, you know, in, in, in for much of, of, of Western civilization, and I would include all those three religious traditions within that umbrella. Um, so you start with that, and then around the Enlightenment, and obviously no, no coincidence, um, you start to get this idea that actually this can be this can be overturned. This idea of the kind of private uh, pedagogical enterprise can be replaced with a more kind of inhuman and more standardised um, mode of learning. And I think particularly significant in this regard is the encyclopedist movement. So in the 18th century, in, in particularly in France, um, you get this move towards basically liberating information from the hands of pedagogical authorities so it's saying okay instead of having this knowledge that is only known by a few and and taught through these often quite um aristocratic uh, means why don't we come up with an encyclopedia where all the information is presented um it's 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 free from any in theory free from any kind of bias it's just information for everyone can be accessed anytime anywhere um very much brings to mind what Plato's warning about information that can that can get into the wrong hands. It's it's kind of completely um it's completely un, unattached from any pedagogical authority. Um, I mean, well, granted, like I'm sure not. You know, it would have still really been an elitist enterprise in certain ways. But but the goal is this this move to have knowledge reflect these new egalitarian values. Basically, that is basically what it is. It's the democratization of knowledge. Um, but in turn, it's also, if you like, the flattening of, of knowledge. It's saying, well, we're not going to bother with this, this very lengthy uh, and, and inherently quite hierarchical um, exchange of knowledge where you have a teacher giving information to a student. It's, it's more, well, we'll make this book available everywhere and anyone can read it. So it's, it's, you know, it's true to those Enlightenment principles. Um, and then... Going back to to what you're saying about about England in the 20th century, you start to see these ideas become really very futuristic. So most important in that regard is H.G. Wells. Um, so he wrote a book, uh, incredibly prophetic book called The World Brain, um, where he describes that in the future, there's going to be this new encyclopedia and it's going to be a global encyclopedia. And it's going to be this body of knowledge that can be accessed by anyone, anywhere. Um, and fascinatingly, he also goes into quite a lot of detail about realistically, what does this look like? And he says, well, it must, of course, be in one language and that language will be English. Um, so it's very, it is so, how, so how convenient in terms of. Yeah, it's it's so it's so accurate in terms of how globalization has was really panned out. It's you have this this vision which is in theory hyper egalitarian, but then actually ends up being hegemonic because if you want to if yeah. you want to reach everyone, then you have to have a dominant language and a dominant system of of thinking. So that is really secular rationalism. And Wells is 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 predicting this yeah. and basically comes true, doesn't it? I mean that that is what what the internet is. Yeah. Um, so you've got H.G. Wells predicting this, and you also mentioned Julian Huxley, also incredibly similar kind of tendency. So Julian Huxley and his founding document for UNESCO, you know, you know UNESCO, the the kind of heritage branch of the the yeah. UN. Um, he is saying that we need this. I don't, I don't want to paraphrase him too much here because I know this text is often a uh, caricature, so I don't want to don't want to buy into it. But he is very much saying a similar thing about a kind of rationalized world culture. Um, yeah. You know, this isn't a completely ruthless one. He does he does talk about the need to preserve some traditional art and architecture. So it's not it's not completely um, you know it's not total kind of blank slate ideology um but it is yeah it's this rationalizing standardizing globalizing project yeah. and so you see that panning out in kind of international relations but also with with knowledge you have the internet which comes along and turns this into a reality so knowledge does become this universally accessible um you know quite magical um you know thing that 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 this innovation that that completely liberates knowledge from yes hierarchy authority but also in my opinion wisdom because once you flatten everything and you just have this mass of dead letters without the authorities necessarily to interpret it um yeah. that that is what you really have is an exaggeration of of the platonic um yeah. danger of, of writing but um in terms of how that compares to ai uh, i mean if you forgive me if i'm if i'm going half on <laughs> but um Although I suppose that is sort of what this is for, isn't it? Um, so, 
yeah, so you have the the internet, which, as I described, is this radical, uh, revolutionary innovation in terms of yeah. knowledge. But like writing, it doesn't necessarily mean the end of wisdom, right? Because the way that people use the internet in learning, for example, I mean, there's no reason why that knowledge can't be brought to life again. Uh, I mean, I think it's harder because people have so much access to to the internet and yeah. it's, it's very hard to, to kind of you know regulate that but at the end of the day you can still bring it to bring it to life i think where ai differs is that it takes it to an even further level yeah. in that it actually does a lot of the thinking for you yeah. so i think education is where this becomes so um detrimental just very briefly um mm. that's excellent um the, the i think the reason why we can bring something to life and this is this is how at least in the occident um that's been understood since the days of plato is that we are embodied logos we are the mm. living being to speak with aristotle that has an access to logos which means to think and to speak to reason and to say it out loud um and hence we can find even in the dead letter as long as it's been written by someone who was a specific mm. finite human being we can find the voice in someone there's also something peculiar about language that we that is precisely not communication i realize this every single day when i have to speak a couple of different languages um is that not everything can be said in every language i cannot say everything that i could say in german and in english and the other way around the same uh, it's similar. Uh, we've got uh, different uh, idioms um, and uh, different ways of expressing something. There are no reflexive verbs, for example, in in English, as there are in 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 German and in French and Italian. Um, so maybe the English language would not be the best uh, to counter well, what I'll, HTML I'll, says. I'll... <laughs> I know. Okay. So. But, and there's also something peculiar about languages when I write you an email uh, and maybe I'm angry, you might you might sense something, even just mm -hmm. in an email, even in an email that's electronically transmitted or digitally transmitted to you. You might sense, why is he angry? Why is there something wrong? Or, you know, uh, even just a, a short text could could have a certain vibe um yeah, and yeah. that's 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 peculiar isn't it um i think the reason why we can at all interact in this weird way that we do now which is twitter and whatever else and text messages is precisely because we we are living logos um and hence we can also sense i can when i read plato i can sense when he when it you know there are passages that he's terribly ironic, almost sarcastic sometimes. He actually also warns against bad dialectics, right? I mean, Plato is not a great liberator. He specific, I mean, some of the things that he says, he says, for example, we should not have everyone have access, and that's not even possible, to the highest way of knowing. Um, the philosophers are those, uh, as he relates at the, well, after the cave allegory in book seven of the politeia are those who rule by their superior knowledge and understanding of the shadows which we cannot get rid of the shadows which are um, mere appearances without an original perhaps even mm. so there is something peculiar about language that now though ai or chat gpt especially uh mimics in a way uh but mimics quite successfully but in other ways and i think you've pointed this out elsewhere and i saw this from you you said that, that one of the worst things to paraphrase you sorry is that there's no voice there's no unique voice to chat gpt yeah well absolutely so i think this is where for me where i worry um about about chat gpt because I mean, the question of a voice, I think, is is such a pertinent one. Um, and I, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, I mean, it's well, I mean, there's some stories. So someone I was someone was was writing something um, for me for. Well, it's a long story, but I, I was I was basically very quickly to tell that something was ChatGPT generated. <laughs> 
like instantly. And I thought, this is why why is this? And I and I and I sort of you know tested it, put it through several detectors, and and it as it seemed I was right. Um and I was and I sort of started thinking, why was this so obvious to me? And it's because it really it doesn't have an idiolect of its own. People will always push back on this and say, oh yeah, but if you ask it to write in the style of Charlotte Bronte, uh, it will it will do okay, fine. But I mean what what I mean is that it, that that again is a kind of invitation. It's just a slightly more focused prompt uh, as to what to imitate. But if you if you just ask it a generic question, it it it's still it's it's imitating basically the available information that's given to it. So instead of actually really interpreting that information in any coherent or dare I say thoughtful um way, um, because I can't can't think, um, it is just simply regurgitating dead letters, basically. It's a kind of conglomeration of existing dead letters. Um, and these dead letters are also, I mean, they tend they tend to be, they tend to be um well, basically corporate speak. So so they tend to they tend to speak in this way, which is it will use phrases such as fundamental rights, marginalized peoples. Think that these these particular stock stock phrases, um, just the way of saying them, which um which do appear so often nowadays, often with, with quite little meaning, I think we can probably um appreciate. And so Chat GPT, it just simply emulates or, or parrots that it doesn't actually have a voice of its own. Um and of course it doesn't, because it doesn't have, in my opinion, that that logos to it. It doesn't have that that deep, discerning, rational principle. And it's that principle which is wisdom like that that's where wisdom comes from it's from discernment um and i think i think the idea of discernment um is is so central really to my critique of chat gpt because i just don't believe that it's ever capable of looking at things and absorbing information in a way that could ever really be informed by genuine lived experience by the the kind of rational almost like the sort of divine rational order of of language and of meaning and of you know because that's um that's so uniquely human and and i think as a as a theist i i think that i believe that that is unique to the human soul yeah um i I interrupted you before um, when you were trying to um, just carve out a little bit more, even what then the difference is precisely between the internet and an LLM, a large language model, I think they call it, uh, like ChatGPT. I think you've already um, kind of said that, but I maybe you could just pin it. Yeah, to the sure, wall for us. sure. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, um, I think this distinction is particularly important thinking about education um and the university and how you know the internet has been used in universities before and, and now how chat gpt is increasingly um and quite terrifyingly um be, being used i say terrifyingly i mean i was in a cafe just the other day and i saw this student i presume student in front of me and she was like writing an essay with chat gpt just you know sipping on a coffee doing it for her and i could see her copying and pasting the contents of the chat gpt into a word document she had in another tab and you know even just conversations i've had with 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 faculty um just about the the alarming um rate at which these technologies are being used. So yeah. um I, I I don't talk about this just to 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 catastrophize, much as I sometimes do have a tendency of doing that. Um more because I actually see it in front of me and yeah. think it's a real problem. The difference is with the internet, sure, you have a lot of autodidacts. I am absolutely an, an autodidact. I've used the internet. I mean it, you know, yeah. of course the internet has there's no way that that people like, I mean presuming your your family don't don't share the same precise interests as you do you know you probably have come to a lot of it through the internet likewise yeah. um but with the internet you know when you're scrolling through a wikipedia article you're still doing an awful lot of thinking i mean there is there is really so much you know co cognition that's going on into how into how you absorb the information you're seeing and then you turn it into an idea um so when you're writing an essay you know, yeah you probably probably are using the internet for a lot of it there's there's no there's no inherent problem really um with with that raw using that raw information to then um co you know uh, come up with your own your own ideas yeah um and that's because when you're when you're when you're using these 
these pieces of information, these reminders, if you like to use the, the platonic language, these kind of exterior reminders, um, they still have to go in really in order for you to convert them into a cohesive idea in the form of an essay or a speech or a presentation. You still have to remember and you have to internalize things for yourself. And something I talked about um, in the in the article is um, the, the um, forgive me, I always fail to pronounce the, the, the Tetis, the dialogue. Yeah, well, you can tell I'm an autodidact because I can't pronounce anything. Um, <laughs> this is my justification. Um, but in the in that dialogue, where Plato talks about the wax analogy, yeah. so yeah. he basically says that memory um, is comparable to a block of wax. So mm. it's the substance in the mind that receives imprints. So when you see something or read something, even or learn something, it makes a figurative stamp in your mind. And if you're somebody who has uh, a strong uh, memory, if you have a, a sort of well well honed intellect, you are said to be of a, a strong wax. You have a, a robust uh, constitution of of your of your metaphorical wax, which means that the images left by your senses they make stronger impressions. Uh, and Plato goes on to present how once those impressions have been formed, you are then able to make associations between them. So making associations between two ideas or two things you've seen forming an abstract concept and you're basically moving up that epistemic scale the the divided line if you like from the things you've seen in your senses to abstract ideas and then to all ideally uh, eternal truths that's that's the sort of furthest furthest you can go on the on the line but it all starts in these waxen uh, imprints if you like of the yeah, senses so, so it's a very with the senses very importantly that it is the yeah. sensual experience that that takes us on this path to the highest knowledge. It's never just purely what ChatGPT is basically trapped in, uh, a non-sensual, yeah. non-experiential realm, if you, or whatever it's in. Uh, yeah, it, so it, it cannot exactly relate what that's... it says. It's not actually Logos because Logos is thinking, but it thought, but it also addresses something and lets something shine forth. And when we discuss something or debate something, we can see the phenomenon clearer at best, um, whereas there are no phenomena for ChatGPT. There cannot be. Well, this is exactly the thing. And, and I think upon a, a sort of cursive reading of Plato, it, it can be quite easy to overlook that because he yes. is saying yeah. truth resides in the realm of forms. It is this incredibly abstract, transcendent realm. Yes. But as he, as he makes it really clear in his dialogues, particularly on beauty, um, any ascent to that realm of ideas does have to begin in the senses. I mean, the most beautiful analogy of that, which he presents in the Phaedrus, is the idea of the soul um, having wings, right? So the idea that the soul, it comes from the realm of ideas and then it descends into the embodied forms. And then as you experience objects of beauty through your senses, mm. uh, he describes it as being a warm stream that, that enters in through the eyes. Yeah. And then the, the warmth of that stream of beauty, it then it softens your your heart, as it were, your, it, so, it softens you at your core. And yeah. then what it means is that those, uh, those, those kind of ligaments where the wings of the soul once were, they are inspired to regrow. And so the more you see beauty in the world, the more the wings of the soul are allowed to, to grow. And then eventually you can then take flight again. So the soul is like a, like a winged creature. Um, and I think not only, aside from that being just an utterly beautiful uh, analogy, it's also really relevant to what you're, you're saying uh, in that if we want to get to those transcendent ideas, we have to begin in these very, fleshy and in these very you know organic yeah. um experiences and so the idea of the wax i mean i like the image of the wax because it's so it's so you know it's it is it is worldly it's uh it's a very kind of you know what fleshy almost flesh-like kind of substance it's 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 yeah. real it's it may, you make imprints into it yeah. um and then once those imprints have happened that's where you go go to the next the next level and you, you move up that that scale um and and as you say the reason why uh ai it, it is so inimical to wisdom is because you're you're circumventing the very need mm. to make those imprints to absorb those things into your soul um, the the whole process of absorption it just it becomes no longer necessary. So what happens is if you want to write an essay with ChatGPT, I mean essentially what you're doing is you're instead of internalizing that information, you're having that information exteriorized to use that that idea of the prosthesis 
um, you're, it's going to this external prosthesis, it's kind of doing the thinking for you and it's reconfiguring ideas into something that looks like an idea that might look like wisdom but as far as you as an individual are concerned nothing has happened to you ontologically you haven't you haven't ascended from any uh, basic information to yes. knowledge and then wisdom yeah. nothing yeah. nothing has actually happened uh, apart from maybe you get an average grade in your yeah, university been, class or whatever yeah. there's been <laughs> no transformation <laughs> so because yeah. knowing for plato is not a justified true belief or anything that is external to us true knowledge wisdom insight means that we have been transformed in our very being uh aristotle will radicalize this even further um and uh, especially in the ethics so the the so the, yeah i'm sorry i probably interrupted you now but just one, oh, one no, second. No, no. Not at all. I, no. <laughs> when when chat gpt was uh rolled out last year i you know as always i try to keep away as much as possible from just about anything that happens and um just anything <laughs> never mind yeah, really technology. anything what what <laughs> so you know if people watch a movie that is everyone has to watch now i try and maybe watch it four years later um and so I never really know what's going on. So this came out and uh, people kept telling me about it. Um, but it's striking that what it is, it's, it, it, it is very reminiscent of, of the shadows in the cave. Um, if, if we want to, uh, use that analogy that the shadows could actually also be, um, uh, dead words that are just, you know, uh, passing by. By the way, just the wax, um, Plato didn't know this, but thousands of years later, we found out that you could actually also imprint sound on wax, uh, mm. which was the uh, origin of the of the vinyl LP. They usually imprinted on wax first. Uh, but anyways, when, when ChatGPT came out, and I've, I've, there was an article in, I think, The Atlantic uh, on how this would threaten the college essay the university essay to and i recorded a short video uh <clears throat> where i tried to be a bit provocative and i said well you know actually the university essay has been dead for decades um because maybe not at cambridge and oxford who knows but what i've seen uh and what i've been i've what i've had to mark in my life uh, Basically, students do best who already write like an, a language model. Uh, the, 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 the less exotic, the less weird, the, 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 the best formatted the essay, um, the better it will perform. It will just perform really well if it's written like a manual. And I'm, I'm talking about philosophy essays here, not anything else. So, you know, in this essay, I will argue that P, this is because boom, 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 boom. And then you go through it and it, it, the, the, in the way you have to mark, as you know, uh, in the UK is you have marking criteria. And I was told repeatedly to just copy paste, copy paste, whatever wording is whatever, you know, this is a 62, 62 you find over here, copy paste that in and then personalize it. So it, it's already gone that way to a certain degree anyways. Uh, and now this seems to be the, the final sort of, or at least a logical conclusion or at least a consequence to the way of higher education, which has become very technicized and uh, streamlined and less about dialogue open dialogue inquiry of ideas and debates but more about getting credit points and you know uh getting your degree in order to get a job etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah absolutely i mean this actually brings to mind one of the few potential positive outcomes of chat gpt exactly yeah. which is that it drives it i mean it's only a, you know a negative one ultimately but but in the, yeah. it, i think it drives what you're describing to such a degree of intensity yes where exactly. you know as, as you say yes. I, I think you are right to identify that 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 already you've got this standardized 
style of writing of expressing oneself um yeah. that that are just becoming so so widespread um but with chat gpt it, you're losing all sense of, of of voice completely and it's becoming so homogenous that i think there's a chance that the problem if this if this escalates um and people take it seriously which i think i th- well a lot of people you know i know but they are taking it seriously um in yeah. in the context of universities yeah. um they might just say well look let's just bring it, bring back vocal examinations yes because that, that that's what i think actually is superior because with the vocal examination i mean you, you know as you say you're going back to that interpersonal um mode of 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 transmitting knowledge and i also just think that it it really gives a space for the personal idiolect um it really does i mean i but personally and, and this, i'm not i'm not proposing this policy because it, it you know somewhat i'm personally benefited from it but i always did so much better with oral presentations at school than i did with with exams and i think that's because in my case and, and as with a lot of people um it's through being allowed to sort of truly express yourself using the tonality and the gestures and the language yeah. that are um that are particular to you um that really shines a light on on somebody's intellect and on somebody's ability to um to come up with ideas for themselves and and um and come you know have original original ideas um and so i think that faced with the extreme of chat gpt maybe this will be something that just to be honest purely to avoid plagiarism if nothing else uh, has to be reintroduced which i think could be a could be quite a good thing Exactly. I, th- I mean, the other, another uh, worse outcome would be multiple choice tests uh, that are taken um, in person, which uh, I I know for a fact is being done at the philosophy department of the University of Bologna, the first university of the world. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. For first year students, simply because there are too many. Um, the University of Bologna attracts thousands of students simply for the fact even with you know sometimes they don't even speak italian they just want to go there because of the first university and they drop out after a year anyways uh but yeah so that's being done in european universities now i haven't seen it in the uk i haven't heard about it um but let's forget about that uh, other extreme um there could actually be a return so when i was in italy we had to take uh, written exams handwritten exams we were sitting for two hours and it was it was your handwriting. You were obviously you weren't allowed a laptop or a phone or anything, uh, so that could come back as well, and um, or oral examination, and also maybe perhaps a complete. Um, that would be my ideal. Uh, maybe even the end of any kind of sort of school like examination in the first place, where it's not so much about credit point hunting, at least not in the humanities. But again, coming back to what it actually was until just about 20 years ago on the continent, at least, where you studied for years and years and years in philosophy, in English or German or Italian uh, or theology uh, without taking basically any exams, writing a few uh, essays, taking oral uh, exams, uh, but not really about not worrying about uh, mark marks or, or, or grades or anything of the sort. Um, until at some point you start taking a few exams about three years uh, in to the study, into your studies. Uh, so that that was that's only changed with the Bologna process, um, mm. which is a different subject, obviously. So that could actually be. I agree with you. I think that this could be that this could come about, and also on the online too. Uh, it, it could be that um, that we actually want to make sure there's a, a, a genuine human being on the other end. So we might. Um, be more open to uh dialogue uh if only on over zoom um but at least you have the face of someone else there uh and so it but it could but i think some will also just be very glad to be you know conversing with uh, what they will might think is a super intelligent machine that can present them the objective truth of the universe without for the, the fallibility of man the- yeah but, but that but that's that's what's so interesting though because it has this illusion um yeah. of being super 
superhuman and being almost transcendent but i would argue it's actually a subhuman it's <laughs> if, I, if i may if i, if I people, may use some, people in, mean in, it. Only in terms yeah. it's kind of infra it's kind of infrahuman in a way because it's not it's it's not super rational right it's not it's not going beyond um the the sort of mass of public opinion to try and discern some some universal truth it's more just a kind of artificial mass of existing opinions about about the truth um without even really it's, discerning them again this yes. idea of discernment i think is, is so important um yeah. and that's why i i think um I was thinking a lot about about Francis Bacon um, lately, as as you do, um, and and kind of his idea of Adamic knowledge, right? Because part of the Baconian project and his motivation for experimental science is trying to recover this perfect uh, Adamic yeah. knowledge, this this you know yeah. knowledge, this apprehension of things that's immediate, uh, that's that's uncorrupted by by the fall, um, yeah. and and whether or not you know he actually believed that that could ever fully happen there was certainly this idea that that we need to redeem uh, knowledge from its from its fallen state and i would argue that ai has the illusion of this adamic knowledge because if you think about it you ask a question and instead of having to go through the trials and tribulations of you know your own ignorance and experimentation it's it's well here's an answer an answer for you it almost is like consulting an oracle uh also it seems uh, and so and so it gives the illusion of of this almost perfect adamic uh instant retrieval of, of knowledge actually it's the most fallen that knowledge could ever be and that's because there's no there's no discernment there's no wisdom um it's it's a pure mass of of, of dead information that that's yeah. not being brought to life by by the spirits um and and real real knowledge perfect true adamic knowledge is about intuition uh it's not about this this mass of of discursive um information it's about it's about intuition it's really a, a spiritual kind of knowledge so i think this illusion of transcendence that one can get with ai really needs to be dispelled this is not the kind of this is not a transcendent kind of knowledge it's not it's just a sped up it's just a sped up human knowledge basically a sped up and and uninspired and undiscerning mass yeah. of human knowledge as you can see i really don't like it actually and i've never no, actually tried to use it, but, uh, but yeah. it's the idea i think it, it's it's da it's dangerous i think i think it, it's a, a false yeah. transcendence and, and it adds a layer of, of mimesis to mimesis uh it, it mimics it mimics mimesis uh, mm. and, and maybe now some some will understand better why Plato is indeed perhaps also not entirely wrong to warn against mimesis and um and Homer's uh so he's he's not about banning all the poets. What Plato points out, I think in book three and book ten again of the Politeia, uh, is that the that Homer, for example, some passages should be banned because Homer, for example, starts speaking in the voice of uh Christ, I don't know how to pronounce it in English, uh, Christ, Crucis or Crises of, of Troy, uh, the, the Trojan uh, priest who comes uh, to uh, ransom his daughter from Agamemnon. And uh, Homer takes on the voice of that priest, so mimics the voice instead of uh, maintaining his poetic uh, distance to the characters. Mm -hmm. That's what Plato, for example, points out. Um, and and yeah, so just to second also what you uh, mentioned, um, the, it, it, it seems that ChatGPT remains on the level of, of doxa, of mere um, opinion, but it's absolutized to, yeah. a, to, a, to a seeming of absolute knowledge. Um, but I think also that we should be careful and, uh, or not careful, but we should, um, Pick up our ears and hear that. Why do they speak of artificial intelligence? They don't call it artificial wisdom. They don't call it artificial spirit. Um, they don't call it even an artificial mind or anything of the sort. They do call it artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, intelligence, very often, we we also have a tendency to absolutize uh, or privilege intelligence, which is, however, um, very often, at least that's how Hegel understands it. Uh, is a recognition. So it's something that is already known that can be recognized, recognized again, uh, and as such be regurgitated, rehashed, um, and is not necessarily uh, leading oneself to think it's a way of recognizing something that's already known in a sense. Mm. 
Yeah, well, exa- exactly. Um, chat GPT does seem to exaggerate um, that tendency. And actually, it, when you were speaking just now, it occurred to me going back to the allegory of the cave. Yeah. It's chat GPT. It's, it's basically like seeing all of the shadows that everybody sees all at once rather yeah. than seeing rather than seeing the lights. Yeah, it's hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's trapped in hell. I, I mean, it's, it's, lit- it's certainly hell if you're a university professor and all of your students, or, or, or you can't tell if they're using it. I imagine that that's, yeah, it's it's a hell on multiple levels, I think. Yeah. And ChatGPT itself is trapped in hell without any possibility for escape. It, it's please, look, please elaborate. I mean, I probably agree, but that, the, that's some. Um, I like, the, I like the, press, the, the, the sheer presence and availability of everything that's ever existed without discernment. That's hell. Mm. That, that's hell. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> Worse yeah, yeah. than Dante's yeah, I, hell, because there's a bit of order, at least in Dante's hell. Uh, but this, it's, 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 a, it's a, 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 a flood uh, mm. of, of sheer availability without discernment. Um, and yeah, it, it's going to be a wild ride uh, this decade. And I wonder if we come out of it speaking still or just uh you know sending each other emojis uh for convenience <laughs> or... but as you were saying earlier though the the human uh, logos means one can discern quite a lot from an emoji <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> no i i think my optimistic if we can end on a high note which is uh out of character for me um <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> is that the Right now, I think there's a lot of excitement surrounding these technologies and people are dabbling with them and they are under the impression that they are this kind of radical new quasi-transcendental innovation. But I think that the reality of that will probably come out sooner or later um, because it fundamentally can only work with what we give it, at least for now. Maybe I'll be proven horribly wrong um, and AI will come and have a mind of its own. I, I think what's more likely is that we'll get exhausted by it, like we'll get tired of it because AI, you know, it, it needs prompts. It needs and it needs original prompts. Otherwise, it's just going to start kind of recycling itself. There'll be this <laughs> kind of decay, I think, where it's just yeah. it, it's got no new sort of stimuli. Um, and so I think faced with the possibility of just boring chat GPT text, boring AI art, um, we could be provoked to actually start creating authentic and truly expressive forms of, of creative writing and art. And there's a, there's a writer, um, Ella Nixon, who wrote a really good article on this, actually. I forget the title, but it was in The Critic. Yeah. Uh, and it was kind of a, a sort of romantic, um, the possibility of, of, from a sort of romantic point of view, the, 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 the banality of AI art actually maybe bringing on a new wave of people who are going to try and reclaim art and make art human again um and i I think that that's that's the best kind of positive argument that you can get really is that in reaction to that banality um, people will start being being truly creative so that's what i that's what i hope and and i guess another example of that would be if as we discussed the chat gpt problem becomes such a such an issue um on the grounds of plagiarism if nothing else that we start returning to oral examinations i mean that's another example of how that that pushback could actually work in our in our favor and, and we start going back to those more organic embodied forms of of knowledge transmission um, that's certainly what i hope um but whether whether that will materialize i guess we will have to see well yeah but on but on the you know on the notion of materialization i agree with everything you just said um it it uh, there is there is material limitation <laughs> to the internet the internet there's no cloud uh the cloud is a some facility that's close to fresh cold water which you know these cloud storage facilities require to uh, i don't know how many thousands of gallons a day to cool uh these data storage centers um and as i interviewed john gray about 10 years ago on transhumanism which is something else that we'll discuss at some point uh and i remember you know in typical uh fashion of of, of Professor John Gray, he said to me, you know, it's more likely that the debt will rise from the from from the soil than, you know, you up being uploaded to the internet. That's so the the singularity has been pushed backwards by Kurzweil many, many times. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's not coming. 
And something else he pointed out, uh, that's John Gray. He said, you know, if you, even if you upload yourself to the internet, someone might be able, so you, someone could just pull the plug. You're exchanging one prison of the flesh for another. Now, to bring this back to ChatGPT, ChatGPT runs on silicon, for example, uh, which is a rare earth, comes from Africa. Uh, it's mined in a certain way, uh, usually using um, the hands of children because they're small enough to mine the material. That's something that's never discussed. So there's a material limitation to computation. Uh, mm -hmm. So it might not ultimately be scalable on the level mm -hmm. that Google was scalable because Google is ultimately just organizing and ordering everything that human beings across the world are putting out on their own servers uh, and in their own time. And yeah, so there is also just a physical material limitation to, to that entire process. And I think it's so important to bring that into the forefront, um, you know, this conversation about transcendence and AI. It's, yeah. it's, but fundamentally, this is the this is the physical world. We are we are in the world. Knowledge is always going to have to be embodied. Yes. And I think if you're given the choice between silicon, which as you've discussed is not really ethical, and also I think is a false promise in terms of the the wisdom it can really offer, and yes. human wetware, if you like, there's this great word that Zygmunt Bauman uses um, to describe kind of organic human capacities. He describes it as, as human wetware. Um, <laughs> and you know, I think if you're torn between the two, you know, this this uh, you know uh, this this uncertain technology uh, you know that that we don't know how long it lasts and human wetware those those whack that wax that you know the kind of worldly the what the you know the 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 embodied um organic side of our nature i think i think it's i think it's pretty clear which one i would which one i would choose <laughs> okay esme thank you so much for your thank time. you so much i really enjoyed this conversation uh, we both have to run, unfortunately. This is why we have to uh, end it here. But we'll discuss transhumanism at some point. And I look forward to that very much. Thank you. That's right. Thank you.